The news isn't real until you hear it. The soon-to-be grandparents sit and rise and pace anxiously in the waiting room. Meanwhile, the grandchild is born, weighed, cleaned, swaddled, laid on the breast of her mother. But the news isn't real for the grandparents until someone bursts into the waiting room and says, she's here, everyone's doing great. Same holds for graduation. All the coursework is completed, the faculties voted, the diploma's in the mail. But until he hears his name, crosses the stage, switches the tassel from one side to the other, poses for a picture with the president, only then is graduation real. Same thing could be said about marriage. A couple commits privately to honor and cherish and, and love one another. They know that they mean that. They go to the courthouse, they get a marriage license. Maybe it's already even signed. But until the officiant says they are now married, the marriage isn't real. There are also devastating examples where until someone proclaims the news, something that happens hasn't yet become real. This happens with the missing soldier, the victims of the terror attacks on September 11, 2001 that we honored yesterday, the person who codes during surgery. In those situations, people are dead. Their hearts are not beating. There is no brain function. But it's not real until the soldiers walk up the driveway or the leader of the search team says, we've concluded our efforts. There's no more signs of life in the rubble. Or the doctor finally calls for time of death. In every case, Somebody has to pronounce the news in order to convert it from an event that happens into the lived experience of real people. The spouse, the college provost, the minister at the wedding, uh, the honor guard, the police chief, the emergency room physician. It is someone's duty to make this proclamation. The proclamation of praise is the duty of a people of faith. God's presence and power are a fact whether or not we respond or vocalize anything to God. But Psalm 96 declares that God's power and presence don't become real for us in our lived experience until we announce it in song. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Singing together, offering praise, making doxology enacts in reality the fact of God's power and praise, power and presence. In the drama of worship, we are placing God once again upon the eternal throne, upon the sovereign throne of all creation. So we debated coming into the fall whether or not to resume vocal choir rehearsal and have anthems in worship. COVID cases were rising, the health of our congregation and community was and still remains top of mind. But as we discussed it, we thought, well, if everybody in the choir has been vaccinated for COVID-19, if they're all willing to wear masks during rehearsal and on Sunday mornings, we think we've mitigated any real threat and we could resume rehearsal. So Mitch uh, polled the choir to see, are you all willing to return with these restrictions and these precautions in place. 
the response to that poll is sitting behind me. The response was overwhelming. Yes, we'll do what we need to do in order to come back together as long as we can sing. As one choir member said to me, I don't care what mask you make me wear, I'll wear whatever as long as it means that we can sing together. Why? Because this person knows that unless she is able to join her voice with other voices, only then does God become real as we sing the sovereign name of the one who reigns over all creation. And when we stop singing, when we stop declaring, when we stop proclaiming and ascribing, God is still sovereign over all. But God's power and presence are no longer real to us. And we begin to direct that praise to other idols and ideologies. Our purpose as Christian people, therefore, is doxology, a people who make real God's reign in the world. Praise is our duty. We are the people who in song and liturgy, who in ritual and prayer, who in architecture and in sacrament, make real the power and presence of God. It isn't just remembering, oh yeah, there is a God that we're doing when we're here in worship. We are actively participating in the genuine presencing of God among us. Without that communal worship, without that doxology and praise, Christian life devolves into something less than Christian life. can't emphasize this enough. Praise, doxology, it's an act of world-making. We're creating a world in which we can know, live, and follow in the will of God. It's the crafting of a world that offers an alternative way of life to the other world-making powers that we see around us that we either recognize and often don't recognize. Something as simple as a child in his bedroom with his Legos is an example of world making. You crack open the door and you find the yarn strung from the bed to the desk with little green army men suspended in the air. There's a fleet of Lego planes on the bed and, and other characters are trapped in the dungeon in the beanbag chair. All those items, the Legos, the army men, the furniture, the yarn, were in the room. They were fact, but they don't become real as this world until the child enacts it in this way. And that power of world making extends into adulthood. It's Walt Disney making a magic kingdom where dreams really do come true. It's the cosplay crowd who descend on a city for Comic-Con literally dressed as their favorite characters from the Marvel comic book series, talking in the idioms and phrases and sometimes even languages of their favorite sci-fi shows, making a world. Video games like World of Warcraft, where the game never ends, you just go on endless missions. And the way that your avatar interacts with other avatars actually shapes what the game means and how it functions. And I know at this point I've lost some of you. What is cosplay? What is World of Warcraft? I've never heard of this. So this one's for you. Um, in your world, it might look more like the sand in the hourglass that defines the days of our lives from 1 to 2 p.m. on NBC each afternoon where somehow Bo and Hope are still an item. <laughs> World make. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, their world making powers, pushing certain clickbait, moving certain advertisements, promoting certain uh, things that you'll click on, links that will align with your political or ideological philosophy so that you can create a world 
where all your ideas of the, of the, the universe are reinforced and anything that challenges it is forced to the margins. Amazon creates a world where every consumer product is or ought to be 24 hours from my doorstep. And then they can help you to figure out what other things you might like to use your disposable income for based on your purchasing patterns in the past. All of this is world making, which is why we need doxology. There are other worlds around us that are not of God and do not further the purposes of God. Doxology, though, makes real the power and presence of God and enables us to live the story of God together just as the child lives that story in his bedroom with his Legos. And just as that child lives that story, so we too can delight in the world-making power that we have in praise. Doxology is our duty, but it is also our delight. And in the duty and in the, doxo in the duty and delight of doxology, we create a world where we can live day by day as the people of God amidst all the other world-making that is seeking to lure us with its idols and ideologies. But with our purpose in praise, we're able to resist those invitations to witness to the one who we worship here and to persevere through the most challenging of circumstances. My grandmother died in the winter of 2008. She was elderly. She'd lived a long life. She'd struggled with Alzheimer's in her last years. We took her back to her old hometown for her funeral. She'd be buried on the hilltop cemetery where her late husband was and next to her parents as well. It was bitterly cold that week. It snowed actually the night before the funeral and the ground was frozen so that the heavy machinery of the grave diggers could not even carve out the spot for the casket the morning of the service. But as the sun warmed through the day, the ground thawed, they were able to prepare the grave site and we wound our way up the hill. We sat in those chairs covered in green velvet. I don't know why funeral homes always cover the chairs in green velvet. But there we were. We read scripture, had a prayer, a blessing. The casket was suspended over the grave with that green astroturf that they lay around it so that you don't have to deal with the dirtiness and the finality of the thing. And after the final benediction was pronounced, no one in our family moved. We just sat there. I don't think anybody knew why. We just sat there. It got to the point where the gravediggers didn't know what to do either, and so they began to lower the casket into the grave. Usually they wait to do that until the family's gone. That's an act of world making, so you don't have to deal with the, the sorrow and the loss as you watch your loved one descend. But they didn't know what else to do. So we heard the motor humming and the anchors on the casket creaking. And as it disappeared, from our sight, my cousin Rachel began to sing from the back row, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And we knew the cue. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And on that hilltop, there on that frozen ground and the astroturf and the velvet chairs, and 
the creaking of the machinery, the earth dug and the sorrow that was felt, the world was made new. It was made by the power of praise into the new creation of God. It became the place where a soul was received into the arms of her Lord, where grace was made real and where hope could reign eternal. Of course, God was already there in that cemetery without us saying a word. But our praise made God's presence known and remade the world for us. And so every time we follow the psalmist's instruction and sing, proclaim, declare God's glory again and again, week in and week out, we are holding at bay the other world-making powers that want to lure us in. So keep singing. It is our duty and it is our delight. Amen.